So this chapter is going to be about circulation and respiration. And this is going to be more of like a comparative chapter where we're going to compare different types of circulatory and respiratory systems and how they differ. So we're going to start out, as you can see, with the circulatory system. And as we've learned throughout the semester, there are open and closed circulatory systems. So let's just review what that means. So here we've got a picture of an open circulatory system. So you can notice that there is a heart and there are some vessels, but then it just kind of dumps that blood out into the sinus of the organism. So what's going to happen is that blood is going to actually mix with the body tissues and fluids. And so that's called hemolymph when that happens. And this is not a very um, advanced setup, can we say, because what's gonna happen is, let's say some damage happens to this organism, it could bleed out really, really easily because all of that hemolymph is just kind of floating around. So this is a less efficient setup compared to a closed circulatory system, which is what we have. So already you can see, look at this guy, he's happy because he has a closed circulatory system. He's like, I'm more advanced. So what's going to happen is here you've got a heart and then you've got these vessels and the vessels are completely closed off and the blood never mixes with the other tissue um, fluids, right? So this is considered to be more advanced for a couple of reasons. One is that it can be controlled very well so we can dilate or constrict our vessels. Um, another one is if we do get harmed, we can have a clot form and that can keep us from bleeding out. So a closed circulatory system tends to be a little bit more advanced as far as that stuff goes. And it makes you happy according to that picture. So let's talk about some functions of our circulatory system. Um, so we've got transportation, regulation, and protection. So we'll start out with transportation. So you can think of your circulatory system like a superhighway. If you need something from your heart to get to your toe, the blood system, the circulatory system is the best way to do that. So a couple of things that are going to use it are going to be your respiratory system, right? So our red blood cells are going to be important for getting oxygen to our tissues and bringing CO2 back to the lungs. So our respiratory system uses it like that. For nutrition, every time you eat something and it's in your small intestine at that point, what's going to happen is absorption and when the sugars and amino acids and all those things you've broken down are getting absorbed, they need to go to different parts of the body to do their job. So your blood is something great that they can just go into and it'll get them to transport it to that area. Um, excretion is another important one. So your cells are constantly making metabolic waste and they need to get rid of it. So dump it into the bloodstream. Blood can take it to the kidneys or wherever else it needs to go and then you're set. So transportation is going to be really important for um, red blood cells. Now, um, or sorry, for your blood. Another one is going to be regulation. So um, we've got a lot of hormones in our bodies and they're going to use the blood to get from place to place. Um, so if you think about endocrine glands, those hormones that they produce would be lovely, but they need to get from place to place and the blood's a great way to do that. Um, temperature regulation is going to be another really important one. Um, and that is talking about in closed circulatory systems, what can happen is if we get really cold, our blood vessels are actually going to constrict and limit the amount of blood that gets to the surface of our body because that's the coolest part of our body and we don't want that to be cooled off by our surroundings. Um, on the flip side of that, when we get too hot, our, going, our vessels are going to do what's called vasodilation, which is where they're going to get really wide and get as much blood to the surface of our bodies so that they can cool off with sweat or anything like that. And that's why like when you're running or something, you get flushed and that's because they're dilating and, and trying to cool you off. Um, some animals can do something really cool that's called a countercurrent heat exchange. Um, and so I've got a picture of that right here. Um, so it's probably easier if I just kind of explain what's going to happen. So if you think about organisms that live in the ocean in like the Arctic areas, like whales and stuff, what's going to happen is those are warm blooded because they're mammals, but they don't want to lose a lot of heat to the environment. So yes, they have blubber to help them do that, but they've got this countercurrent heat exchange that's going to help them as well. So what happens is you've got the warmest part of the body is the heart and the core of the body, right? So that is going to be the warmest blood. And the coldest blood is going to be the blood that's coming from the surface of the organism and their extremities, right? So if that cold blood was going to come back into the heart, it would be too cold and it would actually shock the heart, possibly in a cardiac arrest. So what's going to happen is you're going to have that warm blood coming from the heart set up right below the cold blood that's coming from the extremities. And what's going to happen is as they pass each other, that warm blood is going to give off its heat to that cold blood and warm it up before it gets to the heart and shocks the heart. 
And then that um, warm blood, it, since it's giving up all of its heat, it's going to be cooler when it gets to the surface of the organism, so the organism doesn't lose a lot of heat to the environment. It's a really, really, really nice thing to have when you think about something living in icy waters like that. So that's pretty neat as well. And then the last thing that we're going to talk about is going to be protection. So I've already mentioned um, when we talk about blood clots and things like that, um, so if we were to have some sort of damage, we can form a blood clot and then that can actually keep us from bleeding out. Um, another thing that I'm going to talk about while I pull this up on the computer is going to be um, what's called... Um, white blood cells, right? So I'm actually going to show you a really cool video on YouTube that you should show everybody. Um, and this is a white blood cell um, doing its job that we're going to talk about. Um, so it's such a neat video. So basically what you're going to see here is this is a white blood cell and this little guy right here is a bacteria and you can see that white blood cell just going after it trying to engulf it because it doesn't want it in your bloodstream. The stuff it's pushing out of the way are actually your red blood cells. So pretty crazy that bacteria knows it's getting, uh, getting chased. Um, but eventually you're going to see um, what happens and this is exactly why we have white blood cells to engulf bacteria and keep them from causing infections in our bodies. So I just think that's such a cool video to show you exactly what we're talking about in here. So um, that's going to be our immune defense, right? So as far as the blood goes, it's going to consist of um, a couple of different types of cells and cell fragments within that liquid matrix. So this picture actually is a great way to represent all the things we're talking about. So um, we have the plasma and then we have the formed elements, right? So the plasma is going to be mostly water, but what a lot of people don't realize about the plasma in blood is that it has a lot of really important proteins. Um, that are going to help with clotting and all sorts of different defense mechanisms and things. So it is more than just a watery base to the blood. Then over here, we've got our formed elements. So we have our red blood cells, which are called erythrocytes. And those, their job is to actually transport oxygen and carbon dioxide from the lungs and the heart to the tissues. Um, then you've got your white blood cells, and that was what we just saw the video of. And so um, not only are they going to be used for immunity, they're going to be used for other things as well that you'll get into when you get into anatomy. And then the last part is going to be the platelets. And the platelets are going to be little fragments of cells, but they're going to be very, very important in forming blood clots. So those are going to be the basic parts of blood and all their different functions. So if we um, cruise down here last little bit. Um, now we can get into the actual setup of the circulatory system. So um, we've got our blood vessels and we've got um, different forms, right? Arteries, capillaries, and veins. So arteries are going to be carrying oxygen-rich blood away from the heart. Capillaries are going to be really, really thin and they're going to allow the diffusion of oxygen and CO2. Um, and then veins are going to be the ones that are going to carry that oxygen-poor blood back. So um, there's a cool picture I have here somewhere that I would love to show you. Yeah, okay, this, that's the next slide. Um, so here you can actually see the setup. Here you've got an artery that's taking, <coughs> excuse me, oxygen-rich blood away from the heart. And one thing I want you to notice about it is um, how much thicker an artery is than a vein. So you can see right here a lot of difference there. And so the reason is because the arteries need to be a little thicker because they're going to be taking the brunt of that pumping action and you don't want them to break obviously, right? So eventually that's going to reach the capillaries and the capillaries are literally one cell thick and I think this is such a cool picture. You can actually see the one cell thick and then you can see the red blood cells going through them. So this is where gas exchange can actually happen in the tissues and then the oxygen poor blood that's going to have CO2 in it is going to go into a vein. Now another difference you might notice in the vein is that the veins have valves. Well think about it. If you've got blood in your like calf and it's trying to get all the way back up to your heart, in between pumps, it's going to slosh backwards and you don't want it to keep sloshing backwards. So these valves are one-way valves that will keep it from happening. Um, so here you can actually see how that works, right? So you've got the direction of blood flow and then when it tries to slosh back, the valve will close. So um, that's going to be really, really important in that whole setup. And then the last little part here is um, another one that you'll definitely need to know for anatomy and physiology. And this is the basics of the heart and the way it's set up and um, the, the path of blood through the heart. So this is a very confusing picture. So I actually have it written out in your notes 
um, to kind of show you the cardiac cycle so you can see that here. Now, one other thing I wanted to show you is um, while we were talking about organisms and um, which ones are most advanced and whatnot, we did touch on the fact that their hearts are set up differently compared to um, the less advanced ones. So you can see amphibians, so our frogs and salamanders and things, their heart doesn't really have any sort of wall separating oxygen rich and oxygen poor blood, so it's not a very advanced setup at all. Um, then you can see reptiles have a partial wall, but the wall doesn't go all the way up to the top. So there's still a little bit of mixing. And then when you get over to mammals and birds, we have the best heart that's the most efficient because we have oxygen rich and oxygen poor blood staying separate from one another within the heart. So that's something that we, we talked about really briefly when we were going into that. Okay, um, so back to that, <coughs> excuse me, cardiac cycle. One thing that you've probably all had done is your blood pressure. And what a lot of people don't realize is what it's actually measuring. And what it's measuring is the force that the blood is actually exerting on your blood vessel walls. Um, so typically they say 120 over 80 is normal. They're, they lower that from time to time. I've, I've heard from doctors, but um, that's, that's typically the normal one. So the, the number on the top is your systolic, and then the number on the bottom is your diastolic. So your systolic is going to be when the ventricles are contracting, and then the diastolic is when the ventricles actually relax. And so if you want to see the heart again, you can see where I'm talking about. There we go. So your ventricles are down here on the bottom. Okay. Um, all right. So on the next set of videos, we're going to talk about respiration and compare respiratory systems of different organisms.